Hello, I'm Josh. This is Grace. Um, I'm an artist and lecturer and... I am a lecturer and writer. Um, I work at the Tate Gallery, Christie's, Sotheby's. And I write uh, for the art press. Um, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to review um, uh, Grace and Perry's exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery. And it's called Who Are You? So it starts with this question um, investigating really our identity, all of our identities. What makes up our identity? You know, if you think about um, how complex that is, and that's what really interests Grace and Perry, and is the starting point for the show, um, in terms of perhaps religious identity, family, perhaps education, body image, um, body size. Yeah. Um, and for us it's a very interesting exhibition because it is 14 pieces of work which have been interspersed with a permanent collection at the National Gallery, at the National Portrait Gallery and it's getting people into parts of the galleries that they perhaps don't normally see and it's definitely attracting a really wide and uh, interested audience. And the key thing to bear in mind is the way in which he's been able, he's been allowed to use the permanent collection at the National Portrait Gallery, which of course is a, um, a cast of the great and the good going back to the Tudor period. And he uses the, the grandest uh, wing, which is the Victorian section of the gallery. You've got uh, pictures of Gladstone and Disraeli, great Victorian soldiers and um, philanthropists and industrialists. So I think for Perry, it's, it's a fascinating collection, isn't it? It is a, a kind of a portrait of a nation or a portrait of our interests. And so he's in one way paying respect to that and also kind of slightly subverting it, which is, uh, makes for interesting work. Absolutely. And the, the important thing to bear in mind about Grayson Perry is that he's used craft techniques through his career. So he's quite unusual for a contemporary artist, um, using primarily ceramics and more latterly he's been using textiles and these are mediums uh, that have been in a sense disparaged for a long time haven't they traditionally as craft yeah absolutely absolutely techniques. And, I, and i think it took the kind of 1970s feminist movement possibly to reintroduce those um arguably kind of women's ways of working or craft mm. ways of working back into to fine art and, and Perry calls himself a potter uh, not even a ceramicist so he's quite, uh, quite interested in the language and we should just say that also it's on with Anarchy and Beauty which is an exhibition based around William Morris in the gallery um, which has some really good connections the idea of an aesthetic revolution of craft of making and as Josh says of the kind of hierarchy of making. So Grace I'm going to ask you what do you think about the exhibition. How successful do you think it is? I think it's a massively successful exhibition. I'm really glad it's there. There are people in the gallery that don't normally come to the gallery and as you say Perry is um, attacking this idea of identity and what it is to be British or the many things it is to be British. So I think it's an excellent exhibition. Um, he's everywhere at the moment. Uh, I think he was very clever in that uh, there were lots of platforms uh, that he uh, worked with before the actual exhibition, uh, the TV series, the interviews, uh, guest editorships. So he's already got an audience ready to come and engage with the work. And uh, as you might be aware, he made the exhibition with Channel 4 and the National Portrait Gallery. So there, in a sense, there are three parties to this exhibition. And of course, the sitters or the subjects who he interviews during the course of the series, which you can see at Four On Demand online to catch up. And it's very interesting because, of course, he's learning how to represent them. I mean, he talks about a portraitist, uh, an artist using portraiture, um, being a psychologist and a detective at the same time. So he's evaluating them, uh, assessing their lives, their choices, their crises around identity, and then formulating an artistic response mm. to those particular journeys. I'm not sure whether they are, although they're based on individual people, mm. families, relationships, for me they're more like case studies. Um, I'm not sure about the level of interrogation, um, 
but right. to come and engage with it is, is an exciting thing to do and you will find yourself and your family and your life somewhere in those pieces of work. So do you um, think, he, in a sense, they become archetypes or even stereotypes? I think they do. I think they do. I think you can reflect on people like Hogarth. You know, the same thing is being, uh, is being looked at. So it's very hard to really interrogate individual lives, I think. He tries very hard with Chris Hume, and mm -hmm. in a sense, the Chris Hume part is the most enigmatic. Um, he's struggling with Chris Hume, of course, the former Secretary of State for Energy, convicted or passing on his points to his wife, a kind of family tragedy that comes out of a divorce, a rather bitter one with his wife. And so Chris Hume collaborates, cooperates with Grayson Perry, but at the same time remains very guarded and at one point talks about maintaining his dignity mm. than not wanting to share everything about himself and his particular ordeal. And of course Grace and Perry is desperately mm. trying to get some sense of vulnerability mm. from what he char characterises as the default heterosexual white male mm. that Chris Hume represents in the exhibition. Of course placed within the gallery mm. surrounded by other white, mm. ostensibly heterosexual, um, powerful men. Mm. But I think that's that's the crux of it, isn't it? Somebody like Hume is um, a consummate uh, self-publicist. Uh, obviously, everybody he gets it wrong, but he's always going to project a certain kind of um, person and, and getting underneath that. So it's a battle between the artist and the and the, uh, the person whose portrait it is, I suppose. But I think other things are more personal. And the one I think that really struck me was Memory Jar, this piece yes. about a couple um, in a relationship, in a marriage, where one person is, is dealing, or they're both dealing with Alzheimer's. And it's a very um, beautiful kind of um, pot, and their family photographs are shredded. Uh, you can see images of this little demon on the, on the side of the pot, shredding family uh, memories and photographs. And that, for me, was um, quite a poignant piece of work. Technically, it's uh, mm. very accomplished, isn't it? Because he's using a kind of transfer <coughs> of um, photographic shards onto the pot. And um, he talked about um, how Alzheimer's is personified as, you, as a demon. And it really sort of uh, casts this illness in terms of darkness and lightness. Mm. And the demon has arrived to basically represent a destruction of their past and their mm. shared memories together. Mm. It's a very successful piece, isn't it? It's yeah, very I think that's that's you would it would be hard not to um, to have a relationship a relationship with that piece of work. Um, the other work that I liked um, was uh, the piece that represents Alex, um, the transgendered individual who's undergoing. Um, gender reassignment mm. and it's very um, powerful that story of her transition towards being a man and of course all of the struggles that she well, he now he encountered on this journey um, wooing or persuading his family of its necessity because mm. of course it's a tremendous shock particularly for a parent mm. and then Grayson Perry represents Alex as a Peter Pan because Peter Pan was very inspirational mm. um, to Alex as a child. But in the form of a Benin bronze, that is one of these West African bronzes uh, that are very artistically, technically demanding, uh, they can be seen in the British Museum mm. where um, controversially they were effectively stolen um, from West Africa in the 19th century. Um, but the casting process is very demanding and you get these like amulets around um, uh, the figure um, who's blowing around someone like a triumphant mm. call um, to the natural world. I mean I think that's where Perry um, is very successful. They are objects which make you walk towards them. They are beautifully made, beautifully crafted. Um, they're wonderful colours, they have wonderful glazers, technically they're very complex. So you are immediately hooked and drawn into a narrative, into a story. Um, and they are, you know, I think often political art is not successful, but these are political pieces and they do work. They definitely do work. Although, I have to say, um, I think Melanie, Georgina and Sarah 
which is a, a three, um, I guess, half-size um, ceramic busts of women are, for me, less successful. I think Perry is, is trying to look at uh, body image, body size, the way we portray women. And for me, they are less complex and less successful than the piece you just referred to. Why do you think they're less successful? I think they are, um, there's less of an interrogation. It's, it's much more layered and complex to be female, to be anything. And I think they don't really tackle it. I think it is a, um, it's just one line. I need more, I think, there. The exhibition begins with a large tapestry. Um, Grayson Perry designs on a desktop, so he draws it. And it's called Comfort Blanket. And uh, the starting point is a phrase used by a Hungarian friend um, who came to Britain and described uh, Britain like a comfort blanket in 1956 um, when she flees from the Hungarian Revolution and arrives in Britain um, to encounter all of those British values uh, that we identify with or we pick and choose and it's very humorous mm -hmm. it's rather satirical the queen is presented like the head on a, a banknote um, she's like a kind of generic grandmother yep. smiling benignly I think Perry says she should be your auntie yeah so it's somebody that looks very familiar and the layout of the object is familiar but as you say it's it's somewhere between a, a serious critique and, and fun, and I think that's where he pulls it off. And the underlying important point about it, isn't it, is the fact that we pick and choose. Mm. We have this freedom to build our identity mm. through a whole range of different influences, mm. and of course it evolves, it's never static. But he does play with cliches, you know, like um, Morecambe and Wise, mm. um, referring to a cup of tea, um, the references to soap operas, um, to country life, to yeah. pub culture. There's a lot of references to class, yes. which we would like to think is going away, and, and Perry uh, points out is, is not going away. But I think, as you say, there are lots of references. Now, I'm not sure, do they depend on you being a certain age and a certain demographic? I think when 13-year-olds look at it, it's kind of lost on them. For an older audience it's very much, you can identify with mm. all those kind of cliches. Our generation. Our generation. But it's full of myth and, and um, yeah, it's full of mythology and as you say you mix and match and those things are, are a kind of um, an historical image of Britain. So you do choose, don't you? You do, they're kind of like emotionally warming. I mm. mean, you refer to Fish the NHS, the mm. welfare state. Mm the Beeb, you know, all of these institutions and experiences we have in common being British. But of course being the notion of being British is much more kind of nuanced and complex today and that's because as individuals we have so much more um, opportunity really yeah. today. Yeah. And I think there's a really positive thing about the exhibition. It is, It doesn't give you answers, it, it opens up lots of questions and it is, you should come out of the show scratching your head and smiling because we cannot, you know, politicians try and do it, uh, we're always trying to pin down what it is to be British and it's, it's a collection of myths and memories and shifting identities, I think that's the important thing, it shifts. It's a sort of geological, mm. you know, like strata of different kind of ideas and feelings. The um, Ashford hijab was quite interesting, wasn't it, um, which uh, narrates the story of Kaylee, I believe she's called. Yeah who was rather a kind of confused young woman who drank too much, bought too much and she speaks of her conversion to yeah. Islam and the wearing of the hijab and so Grayson Perry takes that idea of a piece of clothing, the head wrap, the head scarf and designs a, an image that represents her journey and you see her pointing or facing Mecca and she's leaving behind the Ashford Center. retail yeah. uh, park with all of those brands and that idea of consumption yeah. and excess. Which isn't going to answer any questions about identity or that kind of identity, but it is going to get you talking to people about, you know, what next. It should bring up questions. But it's a, it's a, it takes that idea of portraiture you can see throughout the National mm. Portrait Gallery. And 
makes it more like a kind of medieval tapestry, um, almost like the Bayeux tapestry, a kind of progression, an arc, mm. a development in her character. It's actually quite uplifting mm. and um, sensitive. And I, I think that excited me about the show is that humanity that I see in Grace and Perry's work, that sort of generosity of spirit, even perhaps for the most controversial group, um, which is the loyalist uh, grouping yeah. from Northern Ireland, and he goes to Northern Ireland and witnesses some of these parades that take place, these marches, and talks about their exoticism. Uh, coming from mainland UK uh, as an outsider. And so he tries to respect that passion. Yeah, and I think there is a refreshing lack of judgment. I think he's genuinely and excitedly engaged with people, their lives, how they negotiate their lives, the organisations they belong to, their exotic um, marches, um, the way they engage with each other, and I think that enthusiasm is, is definitely, um, it gets you. And you have to make a progress around the gallery, you have to walk about. And so the connection between the pieces, you know, it's more than the sum of the parts, and I think that's very important. He's also gently humorous, he pokes fun at some of his um, subjects. Um, there's that generosity of spirit I've been, I was talking about. Um, but, uh, and, and you can see with the Ryland piece, which he calls the Earl of Essex, and of course, some of us don't know who Ryland is. I mean, I happened to or see the of some of the X Factor programs where Ryland appeared. But I was asking a group of bankers um, in the galleries whether they knew who he was, and many of them looked very uh, puzzled. But it's perhaps the funniest piece, yeah. and arguably the most successful. So it's, it's very concise, isn't and it? And it's surprising, you know, I suppose if you know Perry you think pots, you probably think tapestries, but you see this tiny piece and it's quite unusual and it's quite simple and it draws you in, it's a very small object, so, and you possibly will know both protagonists, you may know neither, so it's, it's, it's quite clever in that it spreads itself. And he uses the historical um, sort of image of a miniature mm. painted by Nicholas Hilliard and others that are in this collection of the National Portrait Gallery and so it takes that device of a tiny little uh, painting from the 16th century and then applies a kind of almost digital yeah. quality. Um, he says it's like an iPhone photograph yeah. on that scale but he surrounds it with a little gilded oval frame and he conflates that idea of an aristocrat from the Tudor court yeah. with, as it were, an aristocrat of contemporary mm. tele television and mm. internet culture. And I think if people criticise Perry, they say it's kitsch. Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with kitsch, but I think it raises itself out of kitsch because of its references and because of the incredible skill, the making and the, and the joy of the aesthetic or aesthetics. They are over the top, they're too full, they're too colourful, and that is a very deliberate thing to do, and they're, they're very engaging, they're very, they call you in. They certainly do, there's a sort of charm mm. that beguiles you. I mean, I was talking to some other visitors and they said, well, it's not going to last, <laughs> that it's not important art, that he doesn't compare to Francis Bacon. But I think that's to miss the point, actually. Mm that they're very relevant, his work is very relevant to today. He's one of the few contemporary artists who directly engages and ad with and addresses um, politics, society, contemporary culture, in quite a kind of honest way that's not yeah. entirely cynical or concerned with himself. No, I totally agree, and I think if, if the individual pieces of work don't last, the ideas and the questions and the engagement lasts. I mean, this is an artist who is not um, in a rarefied kind of gallery space or you know shuts himself away in a studio he's happy to talk about art politics his life uh, his attitude whether it's on Newsnight or Channel 4 or in the gallery and I think that's refreshing and, um, uh, and necessary. And lastly I think it's quite interesting the way in which the exhibition subverts and disrupts a traditional museum display because it, it effectively shoehorns in it makes a space for people who are like most of the visitors, mm. you know, ordinary people. Yeah, we're looking people. at us. Yeah. You know, we're looking at people yeah. who one would recognise in the wider society mm. rather than being, as it were, 
um, part of the great and the good. Yeah. So in that way, it's very democratic, and, and it does get you to look at paintings you probably would walk straight past. So it, it has lots of uses. It's a, it's a good exhibition. So on balance, we'd really encourage you to see it. Yes, it lasts it. through till I think March 15th, yeah, and 2015. Free. Completely free. It's completely free. You can walk in off the street yeah. and uh, see the temporary exhibition, the work by Grayson Perry, but also, of course, the permanent collection, which is not. Um, as well known as say, the collection at Tate or the National No, Gallery. it's not. It's kind of overlooked and some of it feels very old-fashioned, but, but go. You know, it's, it's a free gallery with this, this fantastic intervention, so um, we recommend it. Thank you. Bye-bye.